Hi, this is Megan with the Ashland Public Library here in Ashland, Ohio. Welcome back to our read-along of The Lightning Thief. When we last left off, Percy and his friends had just defeated Medusa. So, we are at chapter 12. We get advice from a poodle. We were pretty miserable that night. We camped out in the woods a hundred yards from the main road in a marshy clearing that local kids had obviously been using for parties. The ground was littered with flattened soda cans and fast food wrappers. We'd taken some food and blankets from Auntie M's, but we didn't dare light a fire to dry our damp clothes. The Furies and Medusa had provided enough excitement for one day. We didn't want to attract anything else. We decided to sleep in shifts. I volunteered to take first watch. Annabeth curled up on the blankets and was snoring as soon as her head hit the ground. Grover fluttered with his flying shoes to the lowest bough of a tree, put his back to the trunk, and stared at the night sky. Go ahead and sleep, I told him. I'll wake you if there's trouble. He nodded, but still didn't close his eyes. It makes me sad, Percy. What does? The fact that you signed up for the stupid quest? No, this makes me sad. He pointed at all the garbage on the ground. And the sky. You can't even see the stars. They've polluted the sky. This is a terrible time to be a satyr. Oh yeah, I guess you'd be an environmentalist. He glared at me. Only a human wouldn't be. Your species is clogging up the world so fast. Oh, never mind. It's useless to lecture a human. The rate things are going, I'll never find Pan. Pan? Like the cooking spray? Pan, he cried indignantly. P-A-N. The great god Pan. What do you think I want a searcher's license for? A strange breeze rustled through the clearing, temporarily overpowering the stink of trash and muck. It brought the smell of berries and wildflowers and clean rainwater, things that might have once been in these woods. Suddenly, I was nostalgic for something I'd never known. Tell me about the search, I said. Grover looked at me cautiously, as if he were afraid I was just making fun. The god of wild places disappeared 2,000 years ago, he told me. A sailor off the coast of Ephesos heard a mysterious voice crying out from the shore. Tell them that the great god Pan has died. When humans heard the news, they believed it. They've been pillaging Pan's kingdom ever since. But for the satyrs, Pan was our lord and master. He protected us in the wild places of the earth. We refused to believe that he died. In every generation, the bravest satyrs pledged their lives to find new Pan. They searched the earth, exploring all the wildest places, hoping to find where he is hidden and wake him from his sleep. And you want to be a searcher? It's my life's dream, he said. My father was a searcher, and my uncle Ferdinand. The statue you saw back there. Oh, right. Sorry. Grover shook his head. Uncle Ferdinand knew the risks. So did my dad. But I'll succeed. I'll be the first searcher to return alive. Hang on. The first? Grover took his reed pipes out of his pocket. No searcher has ever come back. Once they set out, they disappear. They're never seen alive again. Not once in 2,000 years? No. And your dad? You have no idea what happened to him? None. But you still want to go, I said amazed. I mean, you really think you'll be the one to find Pan? I have to believe that, Percy. Every searcher does. It's the only thing that keeps us from despair when we look at what humans have done to the world. I have to believe Pan and still be awakened. I stared at the orange haze of the sky and tried to understand how Grover could pursue a dream that seemed so hopeless. Then again, was I any better? How are we going to get into the underworld, I asked him. I mean, what chance do we have against a god? I don't know, he admitted, but back at Medusa's, when you were searching her office, Annabeth was telling me, oh, I forgot, Annabeth will have her plan all figured out. Don't be so hard on her, Percy. She's had a tough life, but she's a good person. After all, she forgave me. His voice faltered. What do you mean, I asked. Forgave you for what? Suddenly, Grover seemed very interested in playing notes on his pipes. 
Wait a minute, I said. Your first keeper job was five years ago. Annabeth has been at the camp five years. She wasn't, I mean, her first assignment that went wrong. I can't talk about it, Grover said, and his quivering lower lip suggested he'd start crying as I pressed him. But as I was saying, back at Medusa's, Annabeth and I agreed there's something strange going on with this quest. Something isn't what it seems. Well, duh, I'm getting blamed for stealing a thunderbolt that Hades took. That's not what I mean, Grover said. The fear, the kindly ones, were sort of holding back. Like Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy? Why did she wait so long to try to kill you? Then on the bus, they just weren't as aggressive as they could have been. It seemed plenty aggressive to me. Grover shook his head. They were screeching at us. Where is it? Where? Asking about me, I said. Maybe, but Annabeth and I, we both got the feeling they weren't asking about a person. They said, where is it? They seemed to be asking about an object. That doesn't make sense. I know, but if we misunderstood something about this quest, and we only have nine days to find the Master Bolt, he looked at me like he was hoping for answers, but I didn't have any. I thought about what Medusa had said. I was being used by the gods. What lay ahead of me was worse than the petrification. I haven't been straight with you, I told Grover. I don't care about the Master Bolt. I agreed to go to the Underworld so I could bring back my mother. Grover blew a soft note on his pipes. I know that, Percy. But are you sure that's the only reason? I'm not doing it to help my father. He doesn't care about me. I don't care about him. Grover gazed down from his tree branch. Look, Percy, I'm not as smart as Annabeth. I'm not as brave as you. But I'm pretty good at reading emotions. You're glad your dad is alive. You feel good that he's claimed you, and part of you wants to make him proud. That's why you nailed Medusa's head to Olympus. You wanted him to notice what you've done. Yeah, well, maybe satyr emotions work differently than human emotions, because you're wrong and don't care what he thinks. Grover pulled his feet up onto the branch. Okay, Percy, whatever. Besides, I haven't done anything worth bragging about. We barely got out of New York and were stuck here with no money and no way west. Grover looked up at the night sky like he was thinking about the problem. How about I take first watch, huh? You get some sleep. I wanted to protest, but he started to play Mozart, soft and sweet, and I turned away, my eyes stinging. After a few bars of piano concerto number 12, I was asleep. In my dreams, I stood in a dark cavern before a gaping pit. Gray mist creatures churned all around me, whispering rags of smoke that I somehow knew were the spirits of the dead. They tugged at my clothes, trying to pull me back, but I felt compelled to walk forward to the very edge of the chasm. Looking down made me dizzy. The pit yawned so wide and was so completely black, I knew it must be bottomless. Then I had a feeling that something was trying to rise from the abyss something huge and evil. The little hero, an amused voice, echoed far down in the darkness. Too weak, too young, but perhaps you will do. The voice felt ancient, cold and heavy. It wrapped around me like sheets of lead. They have misled you, boy, it said. Barter with me. I will give you what you want. A shimmering image hovered over the voice. My mother, frozen at the moment she dissolved in a shower of gold. Her face was distorted with pain, as if the minotaur were still squeezing her neck. Her eyes looked directly at me, pleading, Go! I tried to cry out, but my voice wouldn't work. Cold laughter echoed from the chasm. An invisible force pulled me forward. It would drag me into the pit unless I stood firm. Help me rise, boy. The voice became hungrier. Bring me the bowl. Strike a blow against the treacherous gods. The spirits of the dead whispered around me. No, wait. The image of my mother began to fade. The thing in the pit tightened its unseen grip around me. I realized it wasn't interested in pulling me in. It was using me to pull itself out. Good, it murmured. Good. Wake, the dead whispered. Wake. Someone was shaking me. My eyes opened and it was daylight. Well, Annabeth said, the zombie lives. I was trembling from the dream. I could still feel the grip of the chasm monster around my chest. 
How long was I asleep? Long enough for me to cook breakfast, Annika tossed me a bag of nacho-flavored corn chips from Auntie M's snack bar. And Grover went exploring. Look, he found a friend. My eyes had trouble focusing. Grover was sitting cross-legged on the blanket with something fuzzy in his lap. A dirty, unnaturally cute stuffed animal. No, it wasn't a stuffed animal. It was a pink poodle. The poodle yapped at me suspiciously. Grover said, no, he's not. I blinked. Are you talking to that thing? The poodle growled. This thing, Grover warned, is our ticket west. Be nice to him. You can talk to animals? Grover ignored the question. Percy, meet Gladiola. Gladiola, Percy. I stared at Annabeth, figuring she'd crack up at this practical joke they were playing on me, but she looked deadly serious. I'm not saying hello to a pink poodle, I said. Forget it. Percy, Annabeth said. I said hello to the poodle. You say hello to the poodle. The poodle growled. I said hello to the poodle. Grover explained that he'd come across Gladiola in the woods and they'd struck up a conversation. The poodle had run away from a rich local family who posted a $200 reward for his return. Gladiola didn't really want to go back to his family, but he was willing to if it meant helping Grover. How does Gladiola know about the reward, I asked. He read the signs, Grover said. Duh. Of course, I said. Silly me. So we turn in Gladiola, Annabeth explained in her best strategy voice. We get money and we buy tickets to Los Angeles. Simple. I thought about my dream, the whispering voices of the dead, the thing in the chasm, and my mother's face, shimmering as it dissolved into gold. All that might be waiting for me in the West. Not another bus, I said warily. No, Annabeth agreed. She pointed downhill toward train tracks I hadn't been able to see last night in the dark. There's an Amtrak station half a mile that way. According to Gladiola, the westbound train moves and moves. Right, so chapter 13, I plunged to my death. We spent two days on the Amtrak train, heading west through hills, over rivers, past amber waves of grain. We weren't attacked once, but I didn't relax. I felt that we were traveling around in a display case, being watched from above, and maybe from below, that something was waiting for the right opportunity. I tried to keep a low profile because my name and picture were splattered over the front pages of several East Coast newspapers. The Trenton Register News showed a photo taken by a tourist as I got off the Greyhound bus. I had a wild look in my eyes. My sword with a metallic blur in my hands. It might have been a baseball bat or a lacrosse stick. The picture's caption read, 12-year-old Percy Jackson wanted for questioning in the Long Island disappearance of his mother two weeks ago is shown here fleeing from the bus where he accosted several elderly female passengers. The bus exploded on an East New Jersey roadside shortly after Jackson fled the scene. Based on eyewitness accounts, police believe the boy may have been traveling with two teenage accomplices. His stepfather, Gabe Ugliano, has offered a cash reward for information leading to his capture. Don't worry, Annabeth told me. Border police could never find us. But she didn't sound so sure. The rest of the day I spent alternately pacing the length of the train because I had a really hard time sitting still or looking out the windows. Once I spotted a family of centaurs galloping across a wheat field Bows at the ready as they hunt at lunch. The little boy centaur, who was the size of a second grader on a pony, caught my eye and waved. I looked around the passenger car, but nobody else had noticed. The adult riders all had their faces buried in laptop computers and magazines. Another time, toward evening, I saw something huge moving through the woods. I could have sworn it was a lion, except that lions don't live wild in America, and this thing was the size of a hummer. Its fur glinted at gold in the evening light. Then it leaped through the trees. Our reward money for returning Gladiola the Poodle had only been enough to purchase tickets as far as Denver. We couldn't get berths in the sleeper car, so we dozed in our seats. My neck got stiff. I tried not to drool in my sleep since Annabeth was sitting right next to me. Grover kept snoring and bleeding and waking me up. Once he shuffled around and his fake foot fell off. Annabeth and I had to stick it back on before any of the other passengers noticed. So, Annabeth said, once we'd gotten Grover's sneaker readjusted, who wants your help? What do you mean? When you were asleep just now, you mumbled, I won't help you. Who were you dreaming about? I was reluctant to say anything. It was the second time I dreamed about the evil voice from the pit, but it bothered me so much I finally told her. Annabeth was quiet for a long time. That doesn't sound like Hades. 
He always appears on a black throne, and he never laughs. He offered my mother a trade. Who else could do that? I guess if he meant help me rise from the underworld, if he wants war with the Olympians. But why ask you to bring him the Master Bolt if he already has it? I shook my head, wishing I knew the answer. I thought about what Grover had told me, and the Furies on the bus seemed to have been looking for something. Where is it? Where? Maybe Grover sensed my emotions. He snorted in his sleep, muttered something about vegetables, and turned to Ted. Annabeth readjusted his cap so it covered his horns. Percy, you can't barter with Hades. You know that, right? He's deceitful, heartless, and greedy. I don't care if his kindly ones weren't as aggressive this time. This time, I asked, you mean you've run into them before? Her hand crept up to her necklace. She fingered a glazed white bead painted with the image of a pine tree, one of her clay end of summer tokens. Let's just say I've got no love for the Lord of the Dead. You can't be tempted to make a deal for your mom. What would you do if it was your dad? That's easy, she said. I'd leave him the rod. You're not serious. Annabeth's gray eyes fixed on me. She wore the same expression she'd worn in the woods at camp the moment she drew her sword against the hellhound. My dad's resented me since the day I was born, Percy, she said. He never wanted a baby. When he got me, he asked Athena to take me back and raise me on Olympus because he was too busy with his work. She wasn't happy about that. She told him heroes had to be raised by their mortal parents. But how? I mean, I guess you weren't born in a hospital. I appeared on my father's doorstep in a golden cradle, carried down from Olympus by Zephyr, the west wind. You'd think my dad would remember that as a miracle, right? Like maybe he'd take some digital photos or something? But he always talked about my arrival as if it were the most inconvenient thing that had ever happened to him. When I was five, he got married and totally forgot about Athena. He got a regular mortal wife and had two regular mortal kids and tried to pretend I didn't exist. I stared out the train window. The lights of a sleeping town were drifting by. I wanted to make Annabeth feel better, but I didn't know how. My mom married a really awful guy, I told her. Grover said she did it to protect me, to hide me in the sense of a human family. Maybe that's what your dad was thinking. Annabeth kept worrying at her necklace. She was pinching the gold collared ring that hung with the beads. It occurred to me that the ring must be her father's. I wondered why she wore it if she hated him so much. He doesn't care about me, she said. His wife, my stepmom, treated me like a freak. She wouldn't let me play with her children. My dad went along with her. Whenever something dangerous happened, you know, something with monsters, they would both look at me resentfully, like, how dare you put our family at risk? Finally, I took the hint. I wasn't wanted. I ran away. How old were you? See me, just when I started camp. Seven. But you couldn't have gotten all the way to Halfwood Hill by yourself. Not alone, no. Athena watched over me, guided me toward help. I made a couple of unexpected friends who took care of me, for a short time anyways. I wanted to ask her what happened, but Annabeth seemed lost in sad memories, so I listened to the sound of Grover snoring and gazed out the train windows as the dark fields of Ohio raced by. Toward the end of our second day on the train, June 13th, eight days before the summer solstice, we passed through some golden hills and over the Mississippi River into St. Louis. Annabeth craned her neck to see the gateway arch, which looked to me like a huge shopping bag handle stuck on the city. I want to do that, she sighed. What? I asked. Build something like that. You ever see the Parthenon, Percy? Only in pictures. Someday I'm going to see it in person. I'm going to build the greatest monument to the gods ever, something that will last a thousand years. I laughed. You? An architect? I don't know why, but I found it funny. Just the idea of Annabeth trying to sit quietly and draw all day. Her cheeks flushed. Yes, an architect. Athena expects her children to create things, not just tear them down, like a certain god of earthquake had mentioned. I watched the churning brown water of the Mississippi below. Sorry, Annabeth said. That was mean. Can't we work together a little, I pleaded. I mean, didn't Athena and Poseidon ever cooperate? Annabeth had to think about it. I guess. The chariot, she said tentatively. My mom invented it. But Poseidon created horses out of the crests of waves, so they had to work together to make it complete. Then we can cooperate too, right? We rode into the city, Annabeth watching as the arch disappeared behind the hotel. I suppose, she said at last. We pulled into the Amtrak station downtown. The intercom told us it had a three-hour layover before departing for Denver. 
Grover stretched. Before he was even fully awake, he said, Food. Come on, goat boy, Annabeth said. Sightseeing. Sightseeing? The gateway arch, she said. This may be my only chance to ride to the top. Are you coming or not? Grover and I exchanged looks. I wanted to say no, but I figured that... I wanted to say no, but I figured that if Annabeth was going, we couldn't very well let her go alone. Grover shrugged. As long as there's a snack bar without monsters. The arch was about a mile from the train station. Late in the day, the lines to get in weren't that long. We threaded our way through the underground museum, looking at covered wagons and other junk from the 1800s. It wasn't all that thrilling, but Annabeth kept telling us interesting facts about how the arch was built, and Grover kept passing me jelly beans, so I was okay. I kept looking around, though, at the other people in line. Do you smell anything? I murmured to Grover. He took his nose out of the jelly bean bag long enough to sniff. Underground, he said distastefully. Underground air always smells like monsters. Probably doesn't mean anything. But something felt wrong to me. I had the feeling we shouldn't be here. Guy, I said. Do you know the god's symbols of power? Annabeth had been in the middle of reading about the construction equipment used to build the arch, but she looked over. Yeah? Well, hey, Grover cleared his throat. We're in a public place. You mean our friend downstairs? Um, right, I said. Our friend way downstairs. Doesn't he have a hat like Annabeth's? You mean the helm of darkness, Annabeth said. Yeah, that's his symbol of power. I saw it next to his seat during the winter solstice council meeting. He was there? I asked. She nodded. It's the only time he's allowed to visit Olympus, the darkest day of the year. But his helm is a lot more powerful than my invisibility hat, if what I've heard is true. It allows him to become darkness, Grover confirmed. He can melt into shadow or pass through walls. He can't be touched or seen or heard. And he can radiate fear so intense it can drive you insane or stop your heart. Why do you think all rational creatures fear the dark? But then how do we know he's not here right now watching us? Annabeth and Grover exchanged looks. We don't, Grover said. Thanks, that makes me feel a lot better, I said. Got any blue jelly beans left? I'd almost mastered my jumpy nerves when I saw the tiny little elevator car we were going to ride to the top of the arch. We knew I was in trouble. I hate confined places. They make me nuts. We got shoehorned into the car with a thick fat lady and her dog, a chihuahua with a rhinestone collar. I figured maybe the dog was a seeing eye chihuahua because none of the guards said a word about it. We started going up inside the arch. I'd never been in an elevator that went in a curve, and my stomach wasn't too happy. No parrots? The fat lady asked us. She had beady eyes, pointy coffee stained teeth, and a floppy denim hat, and a denim dress that bulged so much they looked like a blue jean blimp. They're below, Annabeth told her, scared of heights. Oh, the poor darlings. The chihuahua growled. The woman said, now, now, sonny, behave. The dog had beady eyes like its owner, intelligent, ambitious. I said, sonny, is that his name? No, the lady told me. She smiled as if that cleared everything up. The top of the arch, the observation deck reminded me of a tin can of carpeting. Rows of tiny windows looked out over the city on one side and the river on the other. The view was okay, but if there's anything I like less than a confined space, it's a confined space 600 feet in the air. It was ready to go pretty quick. Annabeth kept talking about structural supports and how she would have made the windows bigger and designed the see-through floor. She probably could have stayed up there for hours, but luckily for me, the park ranger announced that the observation deck would be closing in a few minutes. I steered Grover and Annabeth toward the exit, loaded them into the elevator, and I was about to get in myself when I realized there were already two other tourists inside. No room for me. The park ranger said, Next car, sir. We'll get out, Annabeth said. We'll wait with you. But that was going to mess everybody up and take even more time. So I said, Nah, it's okay. I'll see you guys at the bottom. Grover and Annabeth looked nervous, but they let the elevator door slide shut. Their car disappeared down the ramp. Now the only people left on the observation deck were me, a little boy with his parents, the park ranger, and the fat lady with her chihuahua. I smiled uneasily at the fat lady. She smiled back, her forked tongue flickering between her teeth. Wait a minute. Forked tongue? Before I could decide if I'd really seen that, her chihuahua jumped down and started yapping at me. Now, now, Sonny, the lady said. Does this look like a good time? We have all these nice people here. Doggy, said the little boy. Look, a doggy. His parents pulled him back. The chihuahua bared his teeth at me, foam dripping from his black lips. Well, son, the fat lady sighed, if you insist. Ice started forming in my stomach. 
Um, did you just call that Chihuahua your son? Chimera, dear, the fat lady corrected. Not a Chihuahua. It's an easy mistake to make. She rolled up her denim sleeves, revealing that the skin of her arms was scaly and green. When she smiled, I saw that her teeth were fangs. The pupils of her eyes were sideways slits, like a reptile's. The chihuahua barked louder, and with each bark it grew, first to the size of a doberman, then to a lion. The bark became a roar. The little boy screamed. His parents pulled him back toward the exit, straight into the park ranger, who stood paralyzed, gaping at the monster. The chimera was so tall, its back rubbed against the roof, and at the head of a lion with a blood-caked mane and the body and hooves of a giant goat and a serpent for its tail, a ten-foot-long diamondback grown straight out of its shaggy behind. The rhinestone dog collar still hung around its neck, and the plate-sized dog tag was now easy to read. Chimera, rabbit, firebreed, and poisonous. If found, please call TARDIS, extension 954. I realized I hadn't even uncapped my sword. My hands were numb. I was ten feet away from the Chimera's bloody maw, and I knew that as soon as I moved, the creature would lunge. The snake lady made a hissing noise that might have been laughter. Be honored, Percy Jackson. Lord Zeus rarely allows me to test a hero with one of my blood, for I am the mother of monsters, the terrible echidna. I stared at her. All I could think to say was, isn't that a kind of anteater? She howled, her reptilian face turning brown and green with rage. I hate it when people say that. I hate Australia. Naming that ridiculous animal after me? But that, Percy Jackson, my son shall destroy you. The chimera charged, its lion's teeth gnashing. I managed to leap aside and dodge the bite. I ended up next to the family and the park ranger, who were all screaming now, trying to pry open the emergency exit doors. I couldn't let them get hurt. I uncapped my sword, ran to the other side of the deck, and yelled, Hey, Chihuahua! The chimera turned faster than I would have thought possible. Before I could swing my sword, it opened its mouth, emitting a stench like the world's largest barbecue pit, and shot a column of flame straight at me. I dove through the explosion. The carpet burst in the flames. The heat was so intense it nearly seared off my eyebrows. Where I'd been standing a moment before was a ragged hole in the side of the arch, with melt but metal streaming around the edges. Great, I thought. We just blow towards the National Monument. Riptide, with now a shining bronze blade in my hands, and as the chimera turned, I slashed at its neck. But that was my fatal mistake. The blade had sparked harmlessly off the dog collar. I tried to regain my balance, but I was so worried about defending myself against the fiery lion's mouth, I completely forgot about the serpent tail until it whipped around and sank its fangs into my calf. My whole leg was on fire. I tried to jab Riptide into the chimera's mouth, but the serpent tail wrapped around my ankles and pulled me off balance. My blade flew out of my hand, speeding out of the hole in the arch and down towards the Mississippi River. I managed to get to my feet, but I knew I had lost. It was weaponless. I could feel deadly poison racing up to my chest. I remember Chiron saying that Anacleus most would always return to me, but there was no pen in my pocket. Maybe it had fallen too far away. Maybe it only returned when it was in pen form. I didn't know, and I wasn't going to live long enough to find out. I backed into the hole in the wall. The chimera advanced, growling, smoke curling from its lips. The snake lady, the kidna cackled. They don't make heroes like they used to, eh, son? The monster growled. It seemed in no hurry to finish me off now that I was beaten. I glanced at the park ranger and the family. The little boy was hiding behind his father's legs. I had to protect his people. I couldn't just die. I tried to think, but my whole body was on fire. My head felt dizzy. I had no sword. I was facing a massive, fire-breathing monster and its mother. I was scared. There was no place else to go, so I stepped to the edge of the hole. Far, far below the river glittered. If I died, would the monsters go away? Would they leave the humans alone? If you were the son of Poseidon, the kid in the you would not fear water. Jump, Percy Jackson. Show me that water will not harm you. Jump and retrieve your sword. Prove your bloodline. Yeah, right, I thought. I read somewhere that jumping into water from a couple stories up was like jumping on the solid asphalt. From here, I'd splatter on impact. The chimera's mouth glowed red, heating up for another blast. You have no faith, the kidna told me. You do not trust the gods. I cannot blame you, little coward. Better you die now. The gods are faithless. The poison is in your heart. She was right. I was dying. I could feel my breath slowing down. Nobody could save me, not even the gods. I backed up and looked down at the water. I remembered the warm glow of my father's smile when I was a baby. He must have seen me. He must have visited me when I was in my cradle. 
I remembered the swirling green trident that had appeared above my head the night it captured the flag when Poseidon had played with me as the sun. But this wasn't the sea. This was the Mississippi, dead center of the USA. There was no sea god here. Die, faithless one, the kid rasped, and the chimera sent a column of flame toward my face. Father, help me, I prayed. I turned and jumped, my clothes on fire, poison coursing through my veins. I plummeted towards the river. All right, that's the end of chapter 13. Come back next time if you find out where the person can beat the chimera.